I am a child of God. My God goes before me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No weapons formed against me will prosper. My present suffering pales in comparison to my future glory. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. My God knows my name. Even though I will still be joyful and glad because the Lord God is my Savior. Don't give the enemy a seat at your table. Hey everybody, welcome to our first online service of this new chapter that we're in. Hopefully it won't be long until you can join us in person, but until then, thank you for joining us here online. And also a big shout out to the Cambridge campus who are watching this video today as well. You know guys, things are improving, but it doesn't take much observation to realize that things aren't quite back to normal yet. You know, we've still got all the social distancing, the masks, the capacity limits, protocols. You know, many people are back to work and school as of last week, but this pandemic obviously is not over yet. You know, the toll that it has taken is really immense beyond all of the things that we tend to think about. Look at what the Kaiser Family Foundation has said, and this is the most trusted source on healthcare issues in the United States. They report during the pandemic, about four in 10 adults in the US have reported symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorder, a share that has been largely consistent up from one in 10 adults who reported these symptoms from January to June of 2019. So guys, we're talking about a fourfold increase in this kind of mental anxiety and stress. You know, sickness, death, loss of social interaction, social tension between people of different opinions, the drain of trying to be well-informed and the stress of managing your own actions with the expectations of other people. All of this stuff, guys, it just gets to be a little bit heavy, and I'm sure that some of you are feeling that even today as I'm talking to you. You know, one of the wonderful things about our Christian faith is that it specializes in the concept of peace. It really does. And I'm not just talking about external kind of societal peace that we tend to talk about, but I'm talking first of all about internal peace. In fact, you know, Jesus, who is our master, of course, he's known as the Prince of Peace. Look at what it says in John chapter 14, verse 27. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. In case you haven't noticed, you know, the world really doesn't specialize in peace. It really doesn't. It offers coping techniques, medication, substances, some temporary relief, but it really doesn't bring peace. But Jesus gives peace that the world can't. And it's peace that gets right to the heart of what our greatest angst is. It doesn't just treat the symptoms, it actually gets to the root causes. And it provides a solution to the anxiety and the stress and so on that we face. Well, not only is our leader the Prince of Peace, but the entire Bible addresses the idea of peace. And this is what's so exciting about being part of the Christian faith. You know, the Bible talks a lot about the mind. It really focuses on that on the, in the New Testament particularly. And it identifies the things that wage war against our minds. And it shows us that we are spiritual beings and that we are in a spiritual battle that is being fought around us all of the time. It talks about the fact that we have an enemy that very strategically wants to wage war against our minds and is active doing that all of the time. But it also tells us how we can experience victory over those attacks. You guys, as a pastor, I've counseled lots and lots of people over the years and I've seen what's out there in terms of options to help people that have mental anxiety and depression and mental illness. I've seen what's out there. And guys, I have to say, I haven't seen anything nearly as effective as the Bible when it comes to helping people win the battle of their mind. So I am really excited to be embarking on this series that we're talking about of winning the battle of your mind. The main idea for this series actually comes from a little book called Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. It's a book by a pastor named Louis Giglio from Passion Church in Atlanta. I've been there. And it's a fantastic little book. We'll tell you a little bit more about it as we go through the series. But 
he introduces the whole topic with a story, and I want to share that with you. Not many years ago, Pastor Giglio was feeling really attacked, misrepresented, abandoned, and wounded. I quote him. That's what he says on page one of the book. And he and his wife were in the toughest time of their ministry lives, he says, with darts just flying at Pastor Giglio from literally every direction. The struggles were becoming intense and, as he says in the book, even personal. And bitterness and frustration were really trying to get a hold in his life and a foothold in his spirit. He was doing his best to try to take the high ground in the situation. And as things progressed, finally something happened that seemed like it was vindicating Louis and the actions that he had taken in the situation that basically showed that he had been in the right through all of the criticism that he faced. And he couldn't restrain himself anymore. He knew that he didn't need to, you know, tell his side of the story, that time would eventually do that. But after hearing this news and finding out that he was vindicated, he just couldn't keep quiet. And so he said, well, I at least have to text a friend. So he gets his phone out and he texts his friend. He says, you know what? You'll never guess what happened. You know, I'm not trying to say that I was right, but listen to this. You know, give things enough time and you eventually see people's true colors come through. And he writes this text and he sends the text. And as you can imagine, he was expecting a quick, quick text back from his friend that said something along the lines of, I knew you were right. God is vindicating you, you know. And so he's, he's waiting for this reply, but the reply didn't come right away. So guys, I want you to just press pause on that thought for a second here this morning. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been in a situation like that? You ever been there? You're in a tough stretch of conflict with somebody or with a group of people, and you just need support, you're kind of feeling abandoned, maybe feeling attacked, maybe feeling misunderstood by people, that you can't break free from the endless conversations that are going on in your head as you try to think through this thing and wrestle it down to the ground. Maybe you're feeling paranoid, you're seeking allies, people who will buy into your perspective and get on side with you. Guys, these are easy times when our minds are really vulnerable, when we're in those kinds of situations. Our minds become very open to the enemy's attack. Well, finally, Louis saw the little dots moving in his phone, right, that indicated that the text was coming through. But the one-sentence reply that he got from his good friend was not at all what he was expecting. And here's what he saw. The statement came in, don't give the enemy a seat at your table. That was it. Louis' first reaction was, what the heck? Like, but then he quickly realized that his friend was trying to be good and godly in this situation and was actually right. He was giving him good advice. And Louis saw very quickly, you know what, this wasn't just a human struggle. It was spiritual. And the enemy, the devil, was trying to win the battle of his mind. And Louis in that moment was reminded of the verse in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, where it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Well, through a series of events, this sentence basically led him to writing this book that we are using through this series. Guys, maybe you can relate to Louis' story. Maybe you've been through exact situations like that. Or maybe your anxiety is of an entirely different nature or source. Either way, the truth remains the same, and that is that there is a battle going on for your mind. There's always a battle going on. And the outcome of that battle is way more significant than the outcome of whatever you are currently focused on. You know, we get honed in on these little details and these little battles. The bigger battle is what's most important the battle for your mind. And Louis realized in that moment that he had allowed the enemy to take a seat at his table. Guys, as a pastor, he was well aware that the enemy is a killer who wants to bring him down. He wants to bring all of us down. But he got the vindication that he was looking for, but his mind had become negative and vindictive. It had actually become poisoned by the enemy. He realized that the enemy had come and taken a seat at his table. Well, he took the time to confess his failure and to realign his heart with God. Soon after that experience, Louis was reading from Psalm 23. And many of you read this psalm growing up, even in school. I remember as a kid in public school, we actually, can you believe this? We read Psalm 23 every day in public school when I was a kid. 
I would actually like for us to read it together. Wherever you are this morning, read it out loud with me, okay? Whether it's on your couch, at Cambridge campus, wherever you are, let's read it together. I want to read it from the New King James Version because it's closer to what I remember when I was in grade school growing up. Let's read it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Guys, Psalm 23 is probably the most beloved and quoted passage in the entire Old Testament. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Many of you know it, maybe even by heart. And he saw this passage of the good shepherd with new eyes, Louis did, especially when he got to verse 5 where he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of of my enemies. Guys, this table is something that we're going to talk about throughout this series. Louis got a new vision of himself at a table with a good shepherd eating and fellowshipping together. A table where there is peace, where there's comfort, where there's camaraderie, where there's joy. But as he looks up from the table, and this is the powerful thing, as he looks up from the table, he recognizes that he is still surrounded by all of his enemies. This is what he realizes as he's looking at this passage. You see, the image in Psalm 23 is not one where our enemies have been removed or driven away. They're actually still there. They're still surrounding us if you read this passage carefully. And guys, this is a powerful image, and it's the one that we are going to use that's going to form the foundation for this six-week study that we're embarking on. Because here's the thing, guys, our normal idea when it comes to having peace of mind, freedom from anxiety, it's that our enemies or whatever threatens us needs to be removed from the picture before I can find that peace. And enemies aren't just people that we may be in conflict with. We're talking about all of the things that could be threatening us in our life right now. You see, we think that we'll find peace when we remove all of these things. You've probably said the same thing. I'll have peace, you know, when that bully is transferred to a new school. I'll have peace when my debt is finally eliminated, whenever that's going to be, right? I will have peace when I get out of this toxic work environment that I'm in. I will have peace when this pandemic is finally over. Or I'll have peace when my health issues are resolved. When I find a job, then I will have peace. You see, our vision of peace is the elimination of everything that threatens us, but it is not God's image of peace. You see, the image that he paints that we see here in Psalm 23 is of you finding peace in the middle of your challenge, in the presence of your enemies. And the day that you learn to find peace and joy when everything around you is threatening is the day that you truly become a mature Christian. Where you can look at Jesus in the eyes across the table right? Where you can look at him in the eyes across the table and keep your focus on him, enjoying fellowship with him while everything around you is just going crazy. And so take note, guys, if you are waiting for all of your problems to go away before you can find peace, you will never find it. You won't. And the first lesson of this series is just so important. I don't want you to miss it. Take a look here. This is the lesson. You can't control what enemies threaten you in your life, but you can control who sits at your table. Guys, you are the gatekeeper of your own mind. You are the keeper of your table. And when Satan tries to pull up a seat at your table, you have the ability to resist him, to resist his negativity and his discouragement. Now, this is really, really significant when you really take the time to think this through. Because if you have the ability to resist the devil, it means you also have a responsibility, right? Responsibility means you have the ability to respond. And you need to be engaged in the battle of your mind. This is what this means. Listen, guys, if you are someone who struggles with anxiety, negativity, depression, jealousy, resentment, whatever it is that plagues your mind, you have the responsibility to fight 
And the good news is that this good shepherd that we're talking about will actually come alongside you and assist you in this struggle. Sometimes we get completely overwhelmed by life. And we actually start to believe, you know what? I can't do anything. I can't do anything about this stuff. And we really start convincing ourselves of that. That we've done everything that we can and we're going to remain a victim until someone else finally pulls us out of this pit that we are in. We have a hard time not falling into sort of an either-or mentality when it comes to this. Either I get rid of my problems or I'm just going to continue to struggle in my mind. No, guys, those aren't the only options. You can still sit at a table with the good shepherd in the presence of your enemies. This is what Psalm 23 is teaching. It's a both-and scenario. You can have peace and troubles at the same time. And this is a very new way of thinking for a lot of people. It really is. Guys, we need to come to terms with the fact that life is hard, but that we can still thrive in the middle of a difficult world. And so can our minds. You can thrive. I listened to a podcast this week, and I heard the story of a woman named Yeonmi Park, who escaped North Korea when she was just a teenager. Because she and her family were starving, her parents allowed her to flee to China to find food. Right before she left, she actually had an appendix attack and had to have her appendix removed. Get this, without anesthetic. (laughs) This is how it is in North Korea. But as soon as she was through that, she wasted no time and she went away and tried to make it to China. She managed to survive the border guards by basically being sold as a sex slave. She figured this is better than death. And in fact, she didn't even know what sex was at that time when she was sold into slavery. She talks about how she was not only a slave in North Korea, but how the regime had actually removed certain words from the dictionary in North Korea. Can you believe this? They had no word for freedom, no word for escape. She talks about this, uh, that it was just going to get food. It wasn't the idea of escaping. They had removed that concept from the dictionary. Can you imagine? The word love didn't even exist for them. North Korean kids are so brainwashed. Did you know from their earliest days, they are brainwashed into thinking that North Korea is the best nation on earth. They get them to sing songs like one that's called, in English, Nothing to Envy, where the child actually sings that. We have nothing to envy. We're the best in the world. You know, when she was just a uh, a child, she made contact with a Christian group of missionaries in South Korea uh, who actually led her to faith once she got into China and she was in the sex industry. She connected with these guys online and they actually helped her um, to understand how she could get out of China and how she could make her way to South Korea. Um, They explained to her that she could escape China through Mongolia, which was an extremely dangerous trip through the freezing cold desert. But she eventually made it to South Korea and then eventually to America. And she laughs, now that she's in America, she laughs at how many people in America insist that they are oppressed. She went to Columbia University, and she couldn't believe how many people were talking about being oppressed when she actually knew what it was to be oppressed. Guys, my point in telling you about Yeonmi Park is just to say this. People's minds have survived much worse than the things that we are going through. And it's not to make light of the things that we're going through. They're serious. But people have survived worse. And I want you to get this. Life is hard, but we can still thrive. If you see Yeonmi Park, if you you read her book or you see her online, you see she's very healthy and her mind is very healthy. She had every reason, you know, to be bitter or to be angry, to become a victim. But she did not allow those emotions to stick to her. Guys, the lesson is that we don't need to let the enemy take a seat at our table. I want to talk to you a little bit about a concept that Louis calls, even though I will. If you look in his book, he has a section, even though I will. Guys, we need to learn to develop an even though I will mentality. And let me explain basically what that is. Even though I will mentality is the understanding, yes, that life is hard, But it's still determining to make good choices and not to give in to the enemy who wants to take a seat at your table. And I had us read Daniel chapter 3 this morning because I really wanted to remind you of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because I think it's the perfect example 
from Old Testament Scripture of this even though I will mentality. You have these three courageous young Israelites who lived in exile in Babylon, who rather than obeying the king's decree to bow down and worship his image as God, they choose instead to be thrown into this fiery furnace. And so when the moment the music plays for everyone to bow down and worship the king's image, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are left standing, three young men in the middle of this huge crowd. They were brought before the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, who was very angry and who couldn't believe that they were willing to actually lose their lives not bowing down to him. And after he questions them, they declare that they trusted their God to deliver them, but then they say something really, really powerful and very applicable to what we're talking about. Look at what it says in Daniel 3, verse 18. They say, but even if God does not rescue us, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Guys, did you catch that? Even if we will. See, this is the even though I will mentality. It's understanding that life is hard, but I'm going to make the right decision anyway. No matter what the cost is, I'm still going to make the right decision. That's how you become strong in your mind. That is how you keep the enemy away from your table, and that's how you avoid becoming a victim. You know, even though bad things happen, it's saying, I will not allow my mind to become poisoned by the enemy. Even though I'm under intense financial pressure, even though my spouse is with another person right now, even though that person has mistreated me over and over again, even though we're in this global crisis, I am not going to give the enemy a seat at my table. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had confidence in God as a good shepherd. They trusted his leadership, and they were willing to follow him, even into a fiery furnace. Guys, when you trust God to be your shepherd, you become confident in his care and in his protection. So that even though you are going through those, those deep waters, you know that he has your back. Take a look at verse 4 of Psalm chapter 23 for a second, because as we go back to this passage, it really shows us this idea so clearly. Look at what it says. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I like the older translation, the valley of the shadow of death. That's the literal translation. So much more poetic, right? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So guys, don't miss it. Listen, don't miss this. The good shepherd doesn't just take you to the valley of the shadow of death. He takes you through the valley of the shadow of death. I want you to get that. The good shepherd doesn't just take you to the valley of the shadow of death. He takes you through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes we think God takes us to the valley of death just to leave us there to die. But Psalm 23 says that he takes us through it. Now, of course, all of us are going to die someday, and that will be in God's appointed time. Scripture talks about that. But apart from that specific appointment, guys, God's plan is to walk with you through the valley of death. So listen up this morning. This is going to get really practical. God did not lead you into your current school or workplace for you just to crash and burn there. I know sometimes you might be led to believe that. God didn't allow you to go through the relationship struggles that you're going through for it to destroy you. And God didn't intend for that special challenge that you face right now to be your downfall. He wants to walk with you through this trial and for you to learn how to sit down across the table from him peacefully, confidently, and hopefully. This is what God wants for you. I'm calling this here a table for two. It's a table for two. And again, we're going to use this image a lot through this series. God has set a table for two in the presence of your enemies, and he's inviting you to sit down at this table with him. You know, I thought of a very tangible example of this in my own life this past week. Uh, it kind of came to my attention. My wife and I often work in the evenings. I often have meetings with people in the evenings. My wife often is working at the restaurant where she serves. But when we finally get through all of that, we love to sit down on the couch at the end of the day together. On some days when she's closing at the restaurant and there like at midnight or later, I'll actually go and see her at the restaurant. And while she's there, you know what? I'll just pull up a chair. We'll sit together, just the two of us. Guys, I have to tell you, whether it's on the couch or whether it's there at the restaurant, the power of that fellowship is immeasurable. It's priceless to me. 
sitting down with my wife. And guys, that's what God is wanting to have with you. And imagine if it's so good with like your spouse, how much better with the God of the universe that he wants to sit down and have that time with you. It's what God has always wanted to give us. And we see examples of this through Scripture. In fact, did you know this? Even in the Old Testament tabernacle where God's presence came down to meet with sinful mankind, one of the items in the tabernacle, if you study it out, is actually a special table, a table. And on that table, do you know what there is? It's called the bread of the presence or the showbread was there on this table. And it was actually a picture of God's invitation for us to dine, to fellowship with him. In the New Testament, Christ's blood has given us access to the Lord's table, right? We, we practice communion. We talk about the Lord's table where we celebrate the intimate relationship that we have with him. Guys, this has always been central to what God wants for us. And this is very rich teaching. And I believe that you're going to get so much from this series. I want to give you a challenge today as we're wrapping it up here for week one. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to do one, at least one of these two things this week as you get the opportunity. And you can do both if you want. The first one is a meal alone with God. Here's what I want you to do. I want you just to grab your lunch someday. You can be at work. Just go grab your lunch. Maybe you bring it with you. But then just go and find a quiet place somewhere. And I just want you to share with God all of the things that are threatening you right now. I just want you to spill it out there and to verbalize it with God. I want you to enjoy His presence just to watch and see how you are going to find peace in that situation. All right, so a meal alone with God. You can go in your car somewhere, wherever you've got some quiet peace. It's just you and God over a meal together. Can you do that? The second thing that you can do is a family meal with God. And this is where you just have everyone around the table some night at dinner just share all of the things that are threatening them right now. You might be really surprised. You might not be aware of some of the things that your own family members are wrestling with that are scaring them, that are really putting pressure on them. And I want you to take a few minutes and just pray for each person around the table. It doesn't need to be long, but guys, I'm telling you, you will find encouragement as you gather around the table and you meet with the good shepherd at that table in the presence of your enemies. Guys, we need to start finding peace in the presence of our struggles, not waiting for them to disappear. It's never gonna happen. You need to start finding peace in the presence of your struggles. And if you do one of these challenges this week, send us a little picture just to let us know you did it. We would love that. Media at renewchurch.ca. We'll get that and that will be an encouragement to us and maybe it'll show up somewhere if you give us permission to do that. But we want to encourage each other through this time. These are real tangible ways that we can start putting into practice uh, things that are going to help us win the battle of our mind. Mm-hmm.